online. Um, and we'll be sending out the, uh, the, the details for the program where you can see the event or want to share it with others. So um, I just want to give a little bit of background of, of how this came about. Um, and so we have an amazing lineup of speakers, uh, but just to talk a little bit about uh, some of the work that we've done together before this, this virtual town hall series. Um, so uh, there's, there are many people that have been working on the Great Lakes and many uh, or different organizations, even on the webinar, that have been working on the Great Lakes, a lot of individuals. Uh, working to protect the Great Lakes, and and some of the some groups, uh, for example, uh, Flow, where Jim is from, on the Commons, where Alexa is from, uh, U.S.-based uh, organization Food and Water Watch, uh, Sue Chiblo, who's here with us today, uh, a couple others, Bob Lovelace from Queen's University, and Frank Edewagishek, who's from the United Tribes of Michigan, uh, started um, getting together and talking about uh, the Great Lakes and, and how we can start looking at the, the Great Lakes problems in a different way and, and how we can try and find solutions uh, in a, um, that are a little bit different than, than what we had been seeing. And, and we're all extremely concerned about uh, the different threats to the Great Lakes and been doing a lot of different work to fight fracking and tar sands and nuclear dumps and pollution and extraction and so forth, but we had deeper questions about about the threats to the Great Lakes and the need to find solutions to kind of get more at the underlying causes of the threats. And so a few years ago, um, some of us started meeting and, and really ramping up our work on the Great Lakes uh, and trying to protect the Great Lakes as a commons and public trust. And that's uh, what the report that I that I sent to you uh, by Maud Barlow that was uh, protecting the Great Lakes commons. Um, and so Alexa, Sue, and Jim are going to go into the Great Lakes as a Commons and Public Trust in a little bit more detail. But um, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the work that uh, the Council of Canadians has been doing, along with uh, Flo and On the Commons and, and other partners. And so um, in trying to get the, the Great Lakes protected as a Commons and Public Trust, uh, one, of the, one of the major um, endeavors that we've had is, is uh, organizing a Great Lakes uh, tour and so many of the people on on this webinar are actually from the the speaking tour that we organized that we started in 2012 and we just had our 15th uh, speaking event and so it was a series of events around the Great Lakes um, we had events in Toronto in Duluth um, in Milwaukee in Sarnia and uh, we had different speakers uh, Maud Barlow our national tour and was a speaker. Jim joined us for some of the events. We also had um, uh, some local water activists and, and indigenous leaders as speakers as well. And so we had uh, many great partners with us. Um, and so it was just to, to connect all the different issues uh, that the Great Lakes are facing, uh, like waste dumps, uh, fracking, and low water levels. And we were wanting to also connect the communities that were, that were working on threats. And so, uh, as I mentioned, we had our, our 15th uh, Great Lakes event in Australia. We're actually restarting the, the tour um, in May of this year. And our next uh, stop will be, 16th stop will be on May 22nd. And so the, the idea of the town hall kind of uh, came out of, uh, or was connected to the tour in, in that we wanted people, we wanted to provide a venue for people to to connect with others working on Great Lakes issues and to, to find a, a new way to work on Great Lakes issues. Um, and we wanted to, to provide um, a kind of a forum for people to come up with different solutions and to take public trust and commons principles and apply them to specific issues that people are working on, for example, fracking, clear dumps and so forth. And so the work has been, for me personally, has been really moving and inspiring. I was fortunate enough to, to join Maud and others on some of the speaking tours and, and really saw the commitment of people all around the lakes and who love the lakes and are, are genuinely interested in stopping the threats, the threats to the lakes and protecting them for good. And so I'm really thrilled that, that you all are able to, to join us today. And so without further ado, I will start um, the uh, the speakers, and so we're going to start with uh, Alexa Bradley, um, who is the senior associate at On the Commons, and 
co-director of the Milwaukee Water Commons. So just give me a second, and I will uh, get Alexa's PowerPoint up, and she will start. And Alexa, I'm just going to unmute you now. Just Can everybody hear me? I guess um, let me know if you can't. Get this set up a little bit better. Um, good morning or good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's really great to see all those lights on the map. It's um, kind of remarkable how many people we have from so many places. Um, feels like a little mini commons. You know, we're already showing the the bioregional nature, the 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 cross border, the multicultural nature of a commons uh, today. So uh, it's really exciting to see that. Um, I want to just start with just the, the basic question that brings us here today, which is this idea of the need for a bold new vision and why, why we need one. Um, and so let me just start there. Of course, most of you on the phone are already doing work on behalf of the Great Lakes. You're fighting um, some of the threats and uh, maybe you've even had some really significant victories around those, and so congratulations for that, and um, you know, I feel some gratitude for that. Um, but we also know, and we're on this call because we're facing also a painful reality, which is that um, the threats are actually growing, and there are new threats. Emma, you referenced some of those. Uh, we now have uh, to fight around with tar sands and increased uh, interest in fracking, and um, nuclear waste shipment and storage and so on. And so even with all of our really good work, something's not working, that, that the threats are growing and the lakes are in more trouble. Um, so it's important for us to sort of look at a deeper level of, of what's wrong and kind of what is it that's not working. Um, so something's out of order. Um, but the underlying problems, and I just want to flag a few um, things that I think are important for us to just focus on when we're looking for solutions, is to sort of, you know, what's wrong. And I'll just flag a few. Um, and they're, they're, in a certain sense, they're obvious, but they're also really important to grapple with. So the first is that as a society, as a whole, we continue to mostly view water as exploitable, expendable, a commodity. Um, which is what would explain why we continue to allow certain kinds of industrial, and agricultural, and energy production uses, even though they jeopardize human and ecological health. It's, it's hard to imagine why else we would allow or even contemplate shipping nuclear waste um, or any other toxic substance across the largest body of freshwater in North America. So that's, that's one that just feels like uh, a sort of a key underlying uh, worldview piece that we need to, to confront. The second is the, that political boundaries don't match ecological reality, and there are many examples of this uh, across boundaries, but one um, that's, that's well known is that uh, many years ago now, a Nestle tried to bottle water in Wisconsin, Wisconsin activists rose up, stopped that, Nestle was then able to get the permit in Michigan, um, and, and, it, and still bottles there today. And the irony, of course, is that water isn't land. Um, the same water that would have been impacted in Wisconsin is, is now being impacted from the other side of the lake. As Maud says, we moved the straw from one side of the glass to the other. And so um, that, those kind of ecological realities don't correspond to the way we make decisions. And the last is that people are largely left out of the decisions about our lakes. We don't have a lot of power standing. We don't have a lot of information. We're rarely actually even invited to play a role in terms of um, the care of our lakes. And you know, many people wouldn't have any idea who's making the decision about mining or um, that might impact their drinking water or tar sands shipments or, or many of those other questions or who they should contact or how they might play a role in caring for that water. And so those are some of the things that I think we need to address as we look at um, what could be different. Um, this is why I think a commons approach is really important to look at uh, in terms of the Great Lakes. And, and just a very quick 101 on, on a commons. Many of you may be familiar with that term, but just a very simple definition is a commons is all that we share, take care of together, and pass on to, to future generations, hopefully undiminished. And um, I can't think of a more important commons for human survival, planetary survival, than water. 
Uh, we have to figure out how to better share it, better take care of it. So what does it mean to then think of this as a commons, to claim it as a commons, uh, to work uh, in terms of stewardship, in terms of a commons? And so a couple of things I want to uh, flag about that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important and unifying framework for all of our issues. It's a way of linking what we're doing as a way of taking care of or protecting our commons. It's a way of insisting on a different value system in the public conversation of really asserting a challenge to business as usual. And it's a way of emboldening leaders around the entirety of the Great Lakes, that all of us are commoners. Anyone can be a commoner and that we need to really activate that. Eleanor Ostrom, who was a Nobel laureate several years ago, her spent her lifetime research in the commons and has shown that this way of taking care, this communal way of taking care of uh, our commons and um, having uh, a, a, a shared and communal set, uh, way of stewarding and uh, holding responsibility for something is very effective um, in caring for water in particular, but other resources as well. Um, and it's also an approach that's very aligned in many ways with indigenous approaches to, to water. And so it gives us an opportunity to build alliances around the Great Lakes with indigenous uh, communities. And that's a really important ally. So as we think about activating a Great Lakes Commons movement, we're actually claiming a really different relationship to one another and to the, to the lakes. And I just want to flag a couple of key qualities about what it means to, to, to common, if you will. Um, I'm going to pull up this other slide. Um, so common starts with this, a really different sense of relationship, that we are interdependent with water, that it's a source of life. Um, and uh, therefore, our lives and anyone else's lives are connected to the well-being of the water. So that's just a different jumping off point right away. Um, it's something that we have to share the benefit of and the use of. And so, you know, how to do that well, sustainably, equitably, is a core consideration that you would bring to any planned use or impact of water. It's also a sense of shared responsibility. We don't just uh, think that some NGO somewhere or some government uh, enforcement agency cares for our water, but that we all bear responsibility for that, uh, both to the water, to uh, other people living at, uh, simultaneous with us, as well as multi-generations, people to come, uh, living creatures to come, will be relying on our responsibility uh, for and to the water now. And so the commons really uh, includes that. And lastly, the commons really brings in a sense of collaborative governance that we uh, need to take care of this together that we look at it as a bioregion. It's not just our city or our township or even our state, but that this is a bioregion of interconnected water bodies. And we need to make uh, decisions that are ecologically appropriate um, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a level that makes sense so that we um, give communities that are going to be impacted to sit on by decisions a role in those decisions um, at, the, at the appropriate level. And, and Commons Governance has a whole uh, a way of nesting decision making at the appropriate level so that we all are able to participate in that. So how do we get there? Um, this is a really important uh, question and there's many ways of getting involved and I, I'm going to talk about one, the Great Lakes Social Charter, but you're going to hear about others on this call. Um, there's more also listed on our, our website as well um, and I can, I'll list that link in a minute. But ultimately the Great Lakes Commons will rise because of all of you and, and many other people. Um, we have, uh, you know, we have the responsibility and in a certain way it's easy to say this, but it is up to us. Um, and we need all kinds of people, not just activists, but artists and recreationalists and scientists and farmers and engineers and, and you know, anyone, moms and dads, uh, students, to, to take up this idea of a commons. Um, so I want to say a little bit about the social charter um, before before I wrap this up, that a social charter is a way of articulating what we think are the guiding principles and norms for the governance and care of the lakes. Um, we have been hosting for the last year a process to co-create a set of governing principles for the Great Lakes. And we're using that now, taking it out into the community to begin to activate community leadership in accordance with those principles. You can bring them to your own city process, a community, you can sign on, you can support, you can use them in a classroom. And part of the goal of that is to really legitimize and lay groundwork for commons governance and to also support other legal um, and political and social claims to, uh, that the community has to have a rightful role in protecting our waters and to standing up uh, against some of these threats in a really unified, clear way. 
Um, so you can go onto our website. Um, I think I have that up here. Oh, these are some of the points. So it enables us to define the principles that we believe are rightful for our social for our care of our lakes, activates our leadership, um, hopefully sparks a new um, water ethic, a, a culture of, of stewardship, if you will, and supports commoning at all levels. Um, so um, I'll leave it there. Uh, again, this is our website. We also have a wonderful new video, which is uh, created by Paul Baines, some of you may know, who created the Great Lakes Commons map. And Emma will type up the link to that new video. It's one you can share. It's just a great way to share with people, to introduce them to the idea of the Great Lakes as a commons. And again, thank you so much for being on and uh, for the work that you're doing. Thanks, Alexa. So uh, as Alexa mentioned, there is the video that Paul Dames made. So it's just in the, in the chat box if you want to have a look at it. Uh, so next, we will have uh, Sue Chiblow speak. Uh, so Sue, if you could just uh, start your webcam. And I will just post your presentation. Okay. Go ahead, Sue. Oh, Sue, we can't hear you. I think you'll have to start your, your microphone or connect your microphone as well. Okay, there it is. Can you hear me now? Well, Arlene, bonjour, everybody. Ogama nug kwef dishtakaz makwa dodam ketagon zi bi dunjaba dishtabe koyendao. My English name is Sue Chiblo, and I'm from Garden River First Nation, and this uh, first slide shows you a picture of a river that runs through my home and I call it my home because this river is where I get fish from to eat, where I get clay from to wash myself and all kinds of other things. So first I wanted to give you a little bit of background um, from a Anishinaabek perspective because there are different uh, First Nation communities and nations around the Great Lakes. And this picture is of North America, which we often refer to as Turtle Island. And this comes from our recreation story of how we were put onto the turtle's back that carries us in throughout life. And we, human beings, <coughs> excuse me, were the baby of creation. The, um, all of the animals and plants and everything else was created first, so we as human beings from an initial back perspective anyways, we consider ourselves the baby of creation and thus, thus we need to ensure that we behave properly in order to take care of this great turtle island. And a little bit more background is that I always try to remind people that even First Nations people that one of the most important truths to remember is that First Nations people, we were here. Um, we had our laws, we had our gov we were governing ourselves when the newcomers, the Europeans, arrived. And we were never conquered in any wars by the governments or by the Europeans. And with that, we have our own responsibilities regarding the lands and the waters that were given, us, given to us by the Creator. And we were exercising those responsibilities throughout our territories. And along came the Europeans, so with the signing of the treaties, First Nations believed that we would be sharing the land and the responsibilities in governing themselves. And I say in governing ourselves is again because it's our behaviors that are affecting the waters. It's not, um, you know, it's our activities that we are doing. And hence, our laws are based on behavior modification, undesirable behaviors. And we continued when we signed the treaties. We believed that we were going to, it was part of a peace and friendship, but it would allow us continued access to the lands and to the waters. And first, so therefore, we as First Nations, we've never given up our, any of our rights when we signed the treaties in managing the lands or the waters. So one thing is um, Joseph uh, um, Madaman, who is an elder and a grandmother, uh, 
is, has been very instrumental in creating an awareness around the Great Lakes. And this is a quote from her, um, that the Great Lakes are precious and sacred to our being. And as water is one of the basic elements needed for all life to exist, water is life. And again, um, there are some discussions that we've had. And some of the elders have talked a little bit about um, how our behaviors are affecting the animals, the waters, and what's going on. And there, one elder had talked, told us a story, um, or a teaching, as you will, about one-hearted people versus two-hearted people. And the one-hearted people are the people that are striving for balance and that recognize that their behaviors affect everything that's going on in and around them. Um, they curb their behaviors so that they're not wasteful when it comes to using water, that they're not contaminating the water. And the two-hearted people are the people that are striving for basically more stuff, as we'll, we'll put it. Um, and there's, there's confusion, and they are creating all kinds of imbalance, and it's our responsibility as one-hearted people to try and assist these people in curbing their behaviors. So many Indigenous peoples are aware of the, grow, the growing rise of the polluted waters. And we've been taught again that the waters are sacred, and everyday usage of the waters in many situations has been taken for granted, and the future of our waters will be depleted unless we do something together to help our peoples around the world be aware of its importance for the survival of future generations. And when I say this together, um, many First Nations people, we, we have a prophecy on how one day people will turn around and come to us as First Nations people, as Anishinaabek people, and ask us, how can we work together to stop these destructive behaviors that we have? So historically, the waters were shared between, between the nations. The waters were our highways because there were no horses here um, before the Europeans arrived. And so the waters were our highway. And what we, which, which also indicates that it was, a, it was everybody's responsibility and it was a shared responsibility. And when you'd be traveling the, the water highways and you wanted to come to land, it was your responsibility to tell the people that were on the land what you intended to do on the land, how you were going to behave, how long you were going to be there. And they would decide then and there whether or not they would let you land. And this is um, just a, a, a story that I share on how we used um, the highways, the water for our highways. So what, what have we been doing? Uh, when I worked with the Chiefs of Ontario, I worked for them for several years. And the Chiefs of Ontario is an organization in Ontario that began in 1975. And when I came aboard, um, they are mandated through resolution. And there were binders and binders of resolutions on the environment. So what we did was we compiled them into sections and we broke it down into um, the water, the land, people's behaviors and industrial activities and policy. And one of the biggest, um, it seemed that every year the First Nation people in the, in the assemblies were talking about the water and what was going on with the water. So we compiled um, all of those resolutions. We went out and held a series of meetings throughout Ontario on the water. We spoke with the elders, we spoke with the chiefs, we went to communities. We spoke with the young people. And what evolved out of that is what uh, is the water declaration of the Anishinaabek, the Mishkigawak, and the Ongwe Hongwe peoples. And the symbol, the picture, the little picture you see on your screen is the artwork that came with the declaration. And again, it symbolizes that, you know, the circular motion of the world sitting on the turtle's back. And there's two, two couples there. One is the younger couple and one is the elder couple. And they're showing us um, the, the importance of the water. And above the falls is the moon. So there's in this, in this picture alone, there are many, many teachings. And it was, uh, it was just really neat how this all came together, that that became um, a symbol of the water decoration or the artwork for the water decoration. So the contact, contents of the Water de Declaration, it talks about the First Nation perspective on the water, our relationships to the waters, conditions of the waters, and the right of water and self-determination. 
and also the right of water in the treaties. And again, the right of water and self-determination in the treaties, that's the political component, um, the policy component of it, but our perspectives on the water, our relationships and the conditions of the water. Um, the, act, the artist, I think you can see in the bottom, is uh, Debbie Jackson. And another thing that I have personally have been involved in um, is called the Water Walks. Um, Elder Josephine Mandan um, decided one day that, you know, enough is enough and we have to do something to create an awareness of what's going on with the water. So what she did was she took it upon herself to walk around each Great Lake, every single Great Lake and the St. Lawrence Seaway to begin to create an awareness of what's happening to the water and how we have to start to curb our behaviors in order to ensure that there's water there for future generations. This is a picture of uh, my friend and I walking and after she did the Great Lakes um, and there is a website that Emma will share with you because it just didn't, she didn't do all of the Great Lakes in one year because she is an elder, but after that was completed she decided to do the four directions. So what we did was we went to the four directions of Turtle Island, the north, the east, west, the south, and we picked the water and we walked it all the way back to Bad River, Wisconsin, where the water was reunited with each other back into Lake Superior and where it would have the opportunity to travel back to out to the oceans that it came from. And from these walks, communities now, First Nation communities, are now taking it upon themselves to do walks in their communities. So they're beginning to do the ceremonial walk around the waters, um, connecting people and raising awareness that we, we all need to ensure that there's water for future generations. Another um, campaign that was, um, that I participated in with some youth is uh, the Tuvo Wool Two Row Wampum Renewal Campaign. And again, Emma will provide you with a link uh, after. And this was a canoe journey on the Hudson River. The Onondaga people and their allies of New York, what they did is um, they went into, I think it was up at, uh, I forget where the starting point is anyways, but it's in New York. And they paddled all the way from there all the way down to New York City. And so what we did was every time we paddled, um, we aligned ourselves in two rows to symbolize the two row wampum um, belt, which is which is a treaty that was made about uh, amongst the Onondaga people and the Dutch. And this two row wampum was a treaty on on indicating how we would behave um, and share the lands and and live peacefully together. This was a statewide advocacy and educational campaign and it promoted environmental cleanup and preservation. Um, we did um, some, when we were on the water, we actually did uh, cleanups because it was, it was just amazing when, we, when I first joined this, this journey, um, how sick and sad that water felt. And when my daughter and I were in our canoe on the water, there was dead fish floating around. So we just took it upon ourselves to bring a garbage bag with us and any time we seen garbage floating in the river we'd take it out and put it in our canoes. But we also did some anti-fracking and some nuclear um, protesting in front of uh, some nuclear refinery down on along the water somewhere. I'm not, I'm not that familiar with the state. And so when um, I'm working with the On the Commons group and one of the reasons why I personally decided to work with these people is because this this principle of of um, or this concept of on the commons is something that we as Indigenous peoples had here prior to contact. So I see it as a very effective way of being able to form more alliances with First Nations, eliminating those political boundaries or imposed boundaries that that have been um, imposed on us and starting to really work together and realize that if I'm living up in Lake Superior and I dump something into the water, it's going to reach um, southern Ontario and, and realizing that how connected we are to the waters. And one of the areas that I've been focusing on is what we're calling the first principles. And this is based on, um, again, some elders talking about what we really need to think about 
when we're doing our activism, when we're educating people on, on how we need to curb our behaviors. And so this is going to be um, compiled into the several different languages because, that's, again, that's an educational component to people that, um, you know, First Nation peoples or tribes were not just one people. There was, there's several different languages, several different types of groups. And so we're going to engage some of our language speakers, talk with our elders and our youth, and ensure that we have that voice and create that awareness with them that, you know, this is um, a process that we're trying to, uh, I guess, revitalize and, and share with everybody. And also, too, um, hopefully I can continue to provide a First Nation perspective. Um, and so um, if when, when people, a lot of, uh, some people will ask me, you know, what are you doing, what are you doing this for? I look at my grandson and it's just absolutely imperative to me that when he asks me one day, uh, Nokum, what did you do? I at least can say that, I, well, I tried this and this and this to make sure that you would be able to go to that river you first seen in the screen. And, and be able to get fish from there and to continue to be able to enjoy those waters. So I hope uh, you find this helpful. Miigwech. Thanks very much, Sue Miigwech. Some very, some very powerful lessons and some really great work that's being done. So now we're going to move to Jim Olson. And I am I'm just going to, so Jim, you'll just have to start your your camera and I'll just post your, your PowerPoint. Actually, I'll just request. There we go. So Jim, you'll just, um, or Allison, you'll just have to uh, start the webcam and microphone again, just at the top there. Oh, OK. Yeah, we've got sound. That's great. Thanks for your patience. Can everyone. you hear me now? Yeah, we've got sound. That's great. Thanks for your patience. All right, thank you. Um, I, I had I had said uh, thank you for uh, for the perspective, Sue and Alexa, for uh, casting this uh, new language in a sense. Although uh, what I'd I'd like to talk about is to uh, talk about the public trust, was, which is a language within the Commons recognized in Western jurisprudence, meaning the Western Hemisphere. Um, uh, and I think a very uh, important uh, set of principles for the 21st century with very pragmatic uh, practical application, uh, cutting across issues like uh, standing and opportunities to comment and participate uh, when the system doesn't seem to respond, uh, both affirmatively by opportunities uh, in, in collaboration and cooperation with government as well as resorting to the courts, uh, because after all, uh, there's three branches of government, and sometimes that's what's necessary. Um, so a, a vision for the 21st century, Flow for Water has been working on this public trust idea for uh, almost five years, but, but uh, more so in the last two years after uh, studying and putting a, a report in front of the International Joint Commission uh, uh, asking the International Joint Commission to adopt public trust principles as uh, one of their guiding principles uh, when making decisions under the Boundary Water Treaties, which is affects the boundary waters be between the two countries, including the Great Lakes. So um, uh, in that report, we uh, discovered uh, we discovered that the uh, uh, public trust doctrine was actually recognized in all eight Great Lakes states and both of the provinces, uh, Ontario and Quebec, that encompass this Great Lakes Commons. Uh, and um, uh, this was very important because it comes from ancient principles of Rome down through the Magna Carta. And water as a commons never entered uh, private ownership. Land came down to the United States and Canada in the form of private ownership. 
uh, with rights of use. Now, some of those rights are construed as quite extensive and wasteful, others not, depending on the jurisdiction, which, uh, which is, is a problem, uh, as, as uh, was pointed out by Alexa. Uh, the other thing we looked at uh, more recently is what is what does the public trust mean in terms of the issues of this of this century and what we face today? And some of them have been uh, mentioned, but uh, just quickly, we're looking at how this public trust doctrine uh, works and, and uh, uh, to address such things as the dead zone in Lake Erie and other dead zones in Green Bay and elsewhere in the Great Lakes because of nutrient runoff, uh, uh, mismanagement and, and agricultural practices as well as overflows and sewage treatment failures. Uh, uh, and then looking at extreme energy, uh, as pointed out by Maud Barrow's report, which I think was just released yesterday on extreme energy issues in the Great Lakes, cutting across many, many of the things we're talking about. And then of course, water levels, uh, and then climate change, which obviously uh, encompasses uh, all of the ones I just mentioned, as well as water itself. And we at Flow see climate change as a water issue, not an energy issue. Um, and then invasive species, uh, uh, extensive uh, extreme mining activities, uh, horizontal hydrofracking, unconventional tight rock uh, procedures, and still the underlying threat of diversion and export and the lack of perspective understanding that water is a commons, not a commodity, as, as already existed in public trust law and water commons law in, in this country. Uh, this uh, water cycle slide is here because if you look at all the parts of the cycle, think of these as arcs. You've got your groundwater, you've got plant uptake, uh, you've got infiltration, percolation, runoff, surface flow of streams, uh, evaporation, trans-evaporation, condensation, precipitation, all moving in a cycle, much like that circle, Sue, that you have on that, uh, that symbol of your declaration. Um, and understanding water as a cycle is absolutely key, we think, to solving the these systemic threats uh, in this century, uh, and therefore key to the uh, public trust doctrine. We forget that water cycle and the life cycle are one, says said Costello. Um, so the public trust doctrine, real short, to stay within the time frame here. It's an ancient law, but it, modernly it's been viewed as flexible with wide application. We've seen it applied in Hawaii to protect groundwater from, from uh, in, in connection with uh, channels of water used for development, limiting that development to preserve water in the stream and the groundwater as a public trust. We've seen it recently in Wisconsin, where a groundwater well, uh, uh, the, the approval by Wisconsin of a groundwater well in the Lake Beulah case did not uh, look at the impacts of a nearby uh, lake, uh, and uh, therefore the lake was public trust, and therefore the groundwater activity that would affect the public trust had to be considered, and if it impacted the public trust, limited. So it protects water resources. Substantively, it means there cannot be any material impairment from one generation to the next. Uh, again, very close to the first principles that uh, Sue posted. Uh, it's a paramount protection of public uses over private. The private cannot subordinate the public, interfere with the public uses. These are fishing, boating, swimming, uh, recreation, uh, sustainable survival for food and drinking water and growing food that are recognized by the courts already in all eight states and the provinces. I might say in the provinces, so there's no mistake, public trust is being used in the language but it's called there in the old cases, uh, the public right, the superior public right of navigation and fishing, uh, which cannot be subordinated by government or private parties and the uses cannot be interfered with in, uh, in early English law and Canada law. And those same cases, by the way, uh, uh, are the same cases that uh, the US derived its public trust doctrine from England. Uh, the other major principle is there's an affirmative duty for government to act. They ought to be cooperating. They shouldn't have to be sued every time something goes wrong. They're the, they're the affirmative representative of the sovereign. The sovereign are the people. Uh, and the water is a commons held in public trust, recognized by the US Supreme Court in all eight Great Lakes states, as I said, and the, Ontario, and the Canadian Supreme Court. 
so it's a trust, like the like like a bank. Uh, the body of the trust are the Great Lakes. Twenty percent of the fresh surface water on the planet. If we can get it right here, we can get it right across the board. Who are the beneficiaries? The forty million people that live here. These are the commoners. Who are the trustees? The eight states and the two Canadian provinces and the uh, and the federal governments and. I put the First Nations and, and uh, Native peoples here only because we have to remember that they too are sovereign, uh, but they too are people, and they don't have the separation necessarily because they're both beneficiaries uh, and trustees. <laughs> uh, but it's important to recognize uh, that they are one of the sovereign governments here in the mix. Local governments have a role in their own watersheds. They have a responsibility toward the public trust because no government or person can interfere by impairment from one generation to the next or subordinating it to a private use, a primarily private use. So we think this public trust doctrine uh, in, uh, offers the solutions. And for uh, we don't have time today, but let me just point out a couple of things. I think uh, I recognize uh, the late Joseph Sachs. Joe, Joe Sachs is the... Uh, uh, father of environmental law in the United States in some ways, he wrote the seminal public trust article when nobody had heard about the doctrine in 1970, published in the Michigan Law Review. Uh, and um, the uh, uh, Flo wants to, and, and all of us just uh, take a 10 second uh, moment here. Joe uh, Sachs's memorial is on, on uh, Thursday. So I'm going to just, well, five seconds. And uh, thank you, Joe Sachs, and, uh, for, for, for your work. Um, so Joe Sachs's article, uh, Flo published an article that was released in the Vermont uh, Environmental Law Journal uh, in February of this year. Uh, the site of that article, you can go to their webpage uh, for those that want detail. Um, the, uh, the site of the article is 15 Vermont Environmental Law Journal, page 135. Um, and on pages 170 and 170 through 172, the principles are discussed in each state and in Canada, uh, and they're summarized there for, for those of you that need to look at these principles, because these are the principles that provide the benchmark for the solutions uh, of these uh, systemic threats that uh, we've been mentioning. Um, so we have these systemic threats to the Great Lakes. They are a whole body. Um, I could go into all of them because we're looking at practical applications, but I want to just focus on one to give you an example and leave you with an example of something I think is very real, pragmatic, and hopeful, both in terms of opportunity for voluntary solutions as well as a benchmark or limitation uh, and a basis for imposing and enforcing an affirmative duty if that voluntary cooperation is lacking to solve this problem. Uh, this problem was uh, highlighted recently uh, in a report called LEAP, uh, issued by the International Joint Commission. The International Joint Commission uh, and the science boards, has been boards that have been working on this for several years, uh, have compiled a very significant document. The kind of approach that we need to take on all of these threats cooperatively so we understand the science and how it relates to the hydrologic cycle. Uh, with that hydrologic cycle in mind that I showed you earlier, just think about how farm runoff and climate change uh, and drops in water level and invasive species eating up uh, some of the nutrients so the sunlight penetrates and the water gets warmer. We have a synergistic mess going on here in the Great Lakes Basin. It's serious, it's killing fish, it's closing beaches, and it's going to get worse. And under, underlying all that is the, the reality is that the, the, the phosphorus needs to be reduced by 46%. This is just one example. How do we get there? The countries don't have any legal to, uh, uh, framework that is enforceable. The federal governments don't have anything that's enforceable to address it. It's either voluntary, and then Chesapeake Bay has been working on a similar problem for decades, and they aren't there yet. So the public trust doctrine says no material impairment. We don't have to spend a lot of time 
understanding the causation of this was phosphorus runoff from agriculture going into creeks and streams down the Maumee River and other river watersheds in the basin uh, into whatever lake we're talking about. But in Lake Erie, one fourth of it turning green and dying basically in 2011, and it's still there. Okay, waiting for the right conditions again. So it's a very serious situation. It's in front of us, but it provides a great opportunity where the public trust doctrine could actually be the basis for a benchmark of non-impairment established voluntarily or if necessary by a court that would say you can't, you must reduce by 50%. And by the way, climate change, if that is not addressed, reduction of phosphorus by 50% will lose its effectiveness within 15 or 20 years. So it's a combined situation here. Climate change affects, affects level. It is a public trust issue and a water issue, uh, and it is impairing the Great Lakes. Beautifully, uh, and I applaud the International Joint Commission, in, in their report, uh, for the first time I know of, in all of their records and documents, uh, hist history from the treaty in 1999 concluded, or not concluded, made this recommendation. The government should apply a public trust framework of common law legal principles shared by both countries as an added measure of protection and decision-making tool. Here we have the, the two governments through uh, the, the commission charged with protecting the Great Lakes recognizing this public trust principle for the first time. They've created a new climate, and this is a bold step on their part in the sense that they have joined the work that uh, our speakers and all of you are working on today by recognizing this doctrine as a framework and by understanding that these principles have practical application to move us out of the quagmire of the past and into the solutions and cooperation of the future with real world results. Uh, it's going to take all of us in Lake Erie to make this happen, but we will learn so much from this experience that we can take this to all the other systemic threats and begin to build a way of thinking and a body of principles that are already accepted. We don't have to pass them by a legislature, and the hydrologic cycle connects them all. That water, that hydrosphere in which we live, uh, and that visible Great Lakes and the surface waters that we see and use and rely on. So I'm going to end there. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, thanks so much. So what I'm going to do now, so we don't have that much time, um, I would like to open it up for questions. Um, Um, but I do have actually a couple poll questions that I'd love to ask you guys. Um, so we'd like to know, you'll see it come up on the screen. So what Great Lakes issues are of greatest concern to you? And so you can choose more than one. So just take a moment. I'm just going to upload uh, the, fi the final uh, PowerPoint, and I will um, let you answer these. Okay, it looks like people are only able to choose one, so I'm sorry about that. There's probably more than uh, one that you're quite concerned about. Um, we're just, uh, this is actually the first webinar, as I mentioned, so we're just kind of iron ironing out the wrinkles. So if you could just choose one, um, and then next time we'll try and make it so that there is multiple choice. So I'll just give you another minute.
Okay, and so as I suggested, um, you can type in other issues in, in the chat box uh, for everyone. And I'm just going to, okay, it looks like most of you have responded right now. Um, this is something that we will make available um, just so if you haven't had a chance to respond, you can do so after. Um, I just want to uh, get this moving along. Um, there's actually one more poll that we'd like to do in terms of what different strategies you're interested in learning about. So I mentioned, uh, so this is the first webinar and it will, and it's more, as you noticed, a general overview of the different issues, public trust uh, principles and, and commons principles. And the hope is that we will be, um, well, we will be doing uh, subsequent webinars where we focus on specific issues and how do we apply these public trust and uh, commons principles to different issues. And so there are different uh, strategies that I've put on here. I'm not sure why that keeps uh, closing again. Um, but so municipal resolutions and bylaws, is that something that you're interested in learning more about? Uh, would you like a webinar on um, public events and town halls or days of action? So maybe just take a moment to, uh, to fill that out. Uh, and so there's been some questions uh, posted in the chat box, so I'll be um, going through them um, and trying to give uh, our speakers opportunity to, to answer some of the questions. Any of the questions that aren't answered today, because we're, we might run a little bit over time, I'll definitely uh, send to our presenters and we'll, we'll publish the results. So I'm just going to end this poll now, but I will make it available again. So. And just to, uh, to bring your attention to this screen now, the, so these are some websites where you can get more information on, on what Alexa was talking about um, and, and the great work that On the Commons is doing, uh, particularly the social charter. Uh, Sue Chiblo, um, she mentioned the, the Mother Earth Water Walk and uh, also some other resources that she mentioned are at the link here and also for Jim Olson as well. So I just want to talk a little bit about uh, two reports that are coming out of the Council of Canadians. So Jim mentioned one, uh, so it's the extreme energy in the Great Lakes. It's Maud Barlow's report. I had sent it to many of the participants uh, in the email yesterday, uh, but if you go to canadians.org uh, slash publications, you'll be able to find it there. And it just details extreme energy in terms of fracking in the Great Lakes, tar sands oil um, pipelines and, and shipments. Uh, nuclear waste dumps and so forth, and all of this is happening in and around the Great Lakes. So, a really big concern uh, for us and and flow and on the Commons and, and many other partners. And so, uh, also another report that just came out today is about um, the Can uh, Trans Canada's Energy East pipeline. And so, some of you may know that this, this is actually North America's largest oil pipeline. It's actually bigger than Keystone. And this is also a report that we've come out with along with Environmental Defence. Akiter and Ecology Action Center, and you can also find that on our website at canadians.org uh, slash publications. Um, so I'm just going to uh, wrap this up, but I just want to, um, I'll give people an opportunity to answer some questions, but just want to bring your attention to some future town hall events that we're organizing. So Alliance for the Great Lakes, who I know there's a few people on here uh, from Alliance for the Great Lakes are hosting a, uh, a webinar on tar sands crude shipping on the Great Lakes, and so you can get more information at their website. In April, we'll be focusing on extreme energy in the Great Lakes. What Jim was talking about in terms of nutrient runoff will be the topic for May. Uh, June, we'll be focusing on the Great Lakes Commons Charter, and, and we'll, we'll probably break for the summer, but we will continue the, uh, the town hall series in the fall. So I'm just going to ask, um, the speakers to uh, start their cameras again, and we're just going to get through a couple of questions. I know some of you might have to go because it's um, it's lunch hour, maybe or, or whatnot. But um, but we are still recording, so you'll be able to hear some, uh, some of the questions that not answered, not addressed. We uh, get that up somewhere, send it up to all the participants. So I just, uh, I'm not sure if Jim, Jim, if you're still there, um, but you need to turn your camera and microphone back on. 
But just to answer some of the, the questions, or, or to ask. To, uh, to OK, can you hear me? Yeah. I'll get into And, and okay. you just want to start your camera again. All right. OK. So just one of the questions that was mentioned, and, and I can answer this quickly. I might actually mute uh, you all and, and just kind of give you a chance to, to respond ind individually, just because I'm getting some feedback back, um, but people can see you. Uh, so although, Sue, now you've disappeared. Um, but one of the questions was, I'll just give Sue a minute to come back. One of the questions was uh, had to do with the 16th uh, stop. Uh, so just to uh, clarify, that was, um, that was in Detroit. And so we'll be sending out more information on that. Um, I know there was a follow-up question, and maybe you want to take this. Um, Alexa, but there was um, a question about the status of the Great Lakes Charter. So do you, I'll just unmute you, and do you want to take that? Sure, sure. can you hear me? Am I on? Yeah. Yes? Okay, great. Um, just briefly, um, the Great Lakes uh, Charter, there's been um, a year of work trying to draft a, an introductory declaration, and then to gather an initial set of principles. Our goal with that is to really engage the citizens of the Great Lakes in rethinking what we think the foundational principles should be for Great Lakes governance. And as Sue mentioned, we've been working with an Indigenous uh, languages team to um, bring in first principles from first peoples, and so that'll be part of that. And then uh, we've also got, um, Maud has a set of principles that she had in the last uh, report she did. The city of Milwaukee, uh, the Milwaukee Water Commons has come up with five or six uh, core principles that it feels are foundational for the care of our lakes. And so we're going to be asking people both to sign on to the spirit of the declaration and to share their, um, their sense of what those principles should be. And we'll be hosting that on our website in an ongoing way. Um, again, if you go into the website, there's more details, but uh, it's really an exciting process. And you can bring that charter to communities you're part of either uh, in person or virtually. And we're going to have a whole process around that. Uh, with charter bearers this summer. Thanks. OK, great. Thank you for that. So I'm just going to actually post uh, some questions. Are you seeing the discussion notes in the corner there? Let's see. Um, or maybe not. OK, I'll just read out some of the questions. So there was a question about um, about line nine, and I'm not sure if, if anybody can speak to this specifically. But there was one question about does the IGC know about line nine? So that's a pipeline going from Sarnia um, and and the National Energy Board. It's on it's in Canada, um, but it also starts in Amjanong First Nation, and uh, there's concern about um, reversing the flow of that pipeline. And, and, and oil uh, flowing through it. So I'm just going to read a bunch of questions and, and, and give you guys opportunity to answer some of them. Uh, so there, were, there was, I think this was directed to you, Jim, but are there legal consequences enforceable by both Canada and the US? And that was in relation to um, your, public trust, uh, uh, your public trust presentation. Um, and so, and also, sorry, I'm just going through this way now. So um, maybe I'll just leave those two questions. Jim, I don't know if you want to take that one on a legal consequence for smoke and the US. This document is real. It's just as if there was a statute. It's, a, it's called common law. Anybody as a beneficiary is recognized by most, most courts as having access and standing in the courts. And you can enforce the principle. And, you know, the, 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 the appellate reports of all the states are full of cases uh, like this. The key, I think the key difference in what, what we're trying to, what, what I was trying to say today is the historical cases have sort of focused on the pipe in the, in the water itself rather than the, the, such as climate change, affecting warming and dropping water levels. What we're saying is, if you understand the cause and effect of the hydrologic cycle in, in the world in which we live, uh, and you measure it by what it does to the public trust waters that are already recognized, that that is enforceable. There's a famous Mono Lake case in California in 1984, where 
L.A. was taking water from a tributary that was supposedly not a public trust tributary, destroying a public trust lake, Mono Lake. And the court said, you can't, you can't separate the tributary from the public trust waters if the tributary removal is affecting the waters. Well, I think that's true throughout the whole hydrologic cycle uh, and taking it upstream into the atmosphere, the, hydros the hydrosphere, I would call it. Um, so it is a legally enforceable docking, but doc, uh, doctrine. There's a duty on the part of government. I think it also provides an opportunity to go to government and say, we'd like to have discussions with this in this framework, either a local government, a state government, but here are the principles. We want a discussion. You have a duty, uh, an affirmative duty to uh, protect this water. Okay, great. Thank you for that. So uh, just mindful of time, a couple more questions that I'm not sure if you want to take those. But one question is, um, so how do, how do we help, how can we help people locate themselves in the ecosystem, ecosystem as dependent participants? So that's the question from Kathy. Um, and then also uh, a question um, about also the public trust doctrine again. So what's the most pro promising case you know of when it comes to using public trust doctrine protection of water? What is the most recent effective legal case you know of? So I might, um, maybe I'll just give uh, speakers a, a final minute to answer that. And, and I'm just mindful of time in, in letting people go. And so I will follow up with, uh, with all the comments and questions. There was a question about whether the chat will be published. There's been a lot of great discussion in the chat box. And I noticed um, our Thunder Bay chapter is talking about blue communities. Um, I didn't get a chance to talk about that, but it is uh, trying to take the idea of the commons and, and uh, making it happen within a community and getting a municipality to pass resolutions, recognizing the right to water, uh, banning bottled water, and um, promoting public water services. And so that's some, some, some work that our, our chapters are, are doing. And so we will likely have more information in one of our webinars about local strategies like this. Um, but just to go back to the questions, so how do people locate themselves in the ecosystems as dependent participants? And what's the most promising case you know of when it comes to using the trust doctrine of water? Uh, so I'll start with you, Jim. And, and if you could just take a minute, and then I'll pass it on to, to Sue and Alexa. Time, I'll just answer the last question, because uh, others can talk about locate. I think that's a very question, by the way, there's so many levels to it. Um, but uh, the most promising case, uh, I think uh, th there are several, but the, 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 go to the law review article I mentioned uh, called All Aboard. And uh, there's a discussion of the Mono Lake case. And then historically, the Illinois Central case. Those are two very important cases to understand if, you, if you're going to understand anything, want to understand anything and start, you start with those. Second, um, the most recent, I think, significant cases are the one in Hawaii that I mentioned earlier and the Lake Beulah case in Wisconsin, which connected the removal of groundwater, uh, which was not public trust water, with the, uh, the arc of the public trust waters in the lake, having to consider those impacts and, not, and being limited in groundwater if those impacts violated public trust standards. Uh, th so those are the most important. I also want to say that Lynn Katz Cherry, I noticed, mentions the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, and, and I couldn't agree more that the work and the boards of that, uh, of, of those people and science boards and the citizen groups uh, has been extremely significant. There's a great, great deal of uh, work done there that, uh, that we can draw from. Uh, and it's also administered by the IJC. And uh, I'll just end with, uh, while it's not a court case, this IJC uh, recognition of the public trust principle is a very important for us to, uh, to, take, to carry forward, uh, particularly uh, not only dead zones, but in the, uh, the, the, the entire extreme energy piece, because these pipelines go underwater, overwater ships. The, the public trust is at risk and could be overwhelmed. So, and thank you, I'll just end with thank you, uh, Emma and everybody for this webinar. Okay, wonderful, thank you, Jim. Sue, I'm gonna pass it to you.
think you have to turn your microphone back on, though. I didn't hear you, Emma. Was that for me? <laughs> for, uh, did you say me or for uh, Alexis? Yeah, so I, just, uh, <laughs> um, I said you. You just haven't had a chance to respond to any of the questions yet. So maybe one question. I, um, I don't know if you caught um, the questions, but maybe one to speak to is how do people locate themselves in the ecosystem as dependent participants? Um, well... A, a that's like Jim said. That that is a very big question to answer. But um, what I would recommend is that uh, people find the local water body that's nearest to them, whether that be something that flows in into the Great Lakes or out of the Great Lakes, and go sit beside it, beside it, and just relax and sit there. The the water will guide you. It's it's, it's in your it's your body is consumed or is made up of how much water. There will be a connection. You'll just follow your heart and you'll feel it. Okay, that's wonderful. Great answer. Okay, so Alexa, I'm going to pass it over to you. Uh, I hardly want to add to that. That's a really beautiful answer. Um, I think that um, one of the things I saw, one of the artists we're working with in Milwaukee wrote in, Melanie Arians, asking about artists, and I think we're working with artists in Milwaukee and other parts of the Great Lakes because that's um, another pathway to reconnect people to water is to um, have the arts to invite us to explore, to understand, to um, interact with water instead of just taking it for granted. And so I think that's another pathway. And also to invite people that aren't necessarily water activists to think about water, how it runs through their lives in other ways that maybe are less obvious. Uh, we're working with a number of community leaders in Milwaukee in, uh, in the inner city parts of Milwaukee where they have less access to um, the lake and to find a way that water runs through their lives in terms of maybe they use their water for community gardening or um, for public health or they walk along the river or um, any number of other things. And so looking at how to lift up the gifts of water just in a very day-to-day -day way. And thank you all so much for being on this. It's really uh, wonderful to see all the names of people here and I hope we get to hear from more of you um, next time. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So with that, I'll say goodbye. And so there's been a lot of great suggestions in the chat box, and I'm so happy to see people really interested in continuing conversations after this. And, and there was the mention of a network or a group from today's participants, which I think is a great idea. So I'll, I'll organize that, all that. Um, I'll just send an email out with the, the link to this video, uh, the links that have been, or documents that have been mentioned, and also um, start maybe a, a, a list server or something along those lines. where people can, can continue the conversation. So there was a lot covered today, and, and there's just so much more that can be said about the Great Lakes and, 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 and the vision that we want to create and what we want the, the Great Lakes to be and how we want them to be protected. And so we, this is just the first of the, of the series, and so definitely we'll be discussing more different strategies, um, more threats, and so we hope that you'll join us. So thank you so much much for your participation. Thank you so much, Sue, Alexa, and Jim, for your very insightful and very knowledgeable presentations. And I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thanks. Bye.